up? My name is Charity. I am the worship pastor here. Before we get started, I wanted to explain what happens here, what you might see people take part of, um, what you may take part of. And if you're new here, we're excited you're here. We know it takes a lot of courage to try something out for the first time. So welcome. Well, in this next 20 minutes or so, we're going to be worshiping through musical worship. And worship, we say it every week to a week, is where we thank God for who he is and for what he has done. But over this past week, I went through um, the Bible and went through the Psalms and found words on how we can worship, not just why we worship, but how we can worship. And so I want to go through these with us. So if there's something that relates to you or sticks out to you, I encourage you to take that expression and use it throughout this worship. Um, so the first one is found in Psalm 145. It's to shout praise, which expresses confidence in God's ability. The second one is in Psalm 95 is to kneel, to bless the Lord which expresses humility. The next one is in Psalm 63, and that's the extended hand. If you see people raising their hand and worship, they're not just wanting to ask a question. It actually expresses gratitude, thankfulness, and surrender. There's another word that is the raised hand as well in Psalm 50, but that expresses adoration. The next one is in Psalm 47, and that's to clap, to applaud, which expresses joy and victory. We're not just doing that because we don't know what to do with our hands sometimes. And hey, if that's true, that's fine too. But it expresses joy and it expresses victory. The next one is in Psalm 148 through 150, and that's to celebrate extravagantly. It's the root word of hallelujah, which means to praise God through expressing joy, jubilation, and celebration. In Psalm 33, um, there's a word that means singing scripture to instruct and encourage. And along the same lines in Psalm, 1, Psalm 39, it's prayer, which is often sung as prayer and petition. So when you're reading these words, that's actually what we're doing. You're singing these words over yourself as a prayer, over your family, over your friends as a prayer. Um, and to encourage yourself as well. That's the practical way. In 2 Samuel, um, it, there is the expression to dance, as in David danced before the Lord with all of his might. It's not a weak thing, it's a strength thing. Um, and that expresses joy and celebration as well. And then the last one is in Psalm 4 and 6, and it is to make music by striking the fingers on strings or parts of musical instruments. So when we play instrumentally like we're doing right now, it's not just church cocktail music, it's worshiping God. So I encourage you to express yourself the way um, that you relate to, and let's sing together today.
Derek, I'm just going to ask one time, let you respond big. How are y'all this morning? Love it. Love it. Good to see you guys here today. I want to take a second and say to anybody, if you're visiting for the very first time, man, we love when people check out our church. And our rule is, man, even if it's your first time, we want you to feel like family, all right? We, we extend that to you and we say, hey, you are family to us. So we'd love to get to know you. A little bit, one thing you could do is stop by the info bar on the way out, out there in the lobby. Just say, hey, uh, introduce yourself, and actually, we have a gift for you, all right? We'll give you a gift just for coming 
and letting us know where you're here. But we know that's a big deal, so thanks for being a part of that. And if you're around Peak City enough, you hear us use these words. We all want to be culture builders. We want to change our culture here at the church, but also in Colorado Springs. We want to be a joy and a light. And part of being a culture builder is just giving to this mission that God has called us to do and we're in a fun season where we're kind of ramping down like the building of the new building over at Dublin we're ramping down on some things like COVID which means we're ramping up in awesome opportunities uh, just to do big ministry on God's behalf and and that doesn't come for free we want to be culture builders we want to invest in that so if you're curious about what that means uh, to give to our mission you can go to our website peakcityco.com slash give and you can see how to set up recurring giving there but we also just want to say thank you for anybody that is giving that's huge and that allows us to do what we do here and change cultures and i know right around the corner god's got big big things in store so we're excited about that but man we're so glad you're here today pd's teaching today you see those easter cards those invites on your chairs we're going to tell you a little bit about those but before we do that go ahead and turn to somebody around you say hello tell them good morning and then grab a seat favorite things at Peak City is when you show up for the first time. We know that coming to church for the first time takes a ton of courage and we want to honor that incredible step you've taken. If you're visiting us for the first time, we got a special gift for you. Stop by the info bar on your way out today and let us know it's your first time. We would love to meet you and answer any questions you have about Peak City. See you at the info bar. The best way to get connected around here is by joining a team. If you've been wanting to make some friends at Peak City, or maybe you felt like it's time for you to step up and start serving, then connecting on a team is the best thing for you. Whether you're thinking about serving somewhere in the community or jumping into one of our ministries like kids, youth, worship, and production, leading groups, or connections, there is a place for you where you'll meet people like you. Connecting on a team is the best way to get plugged in and be a part of the Peak City family. So if you're ready to take a step and join a team here at Peak City, stop by the info bar today. Awesome. What's up, everybody? (laughs) Always something interesting happening. Always a good day. Man, I'm so glad you're here. If you're brand new for the very first time, welcome. My name is Petey. I'm the lead pastor here. Would love to get to meet you afterwards. My wife, Brittany, and I will be here in the auditorium afterwards for a few minutes, and we'll be out in the lobby. Would love to say hey to you. This is a crazy, crazy, exciting several weeks we have in front of us. I cannot believe March is almost over. The year 2021 is like warp speed. It is going by so, so, so quick. Um, But man, there's a lot of exciting things happening. Like Derek said, you got the invite cards on your seats. We got Easter coming up uh, in just two weeks. All right, two weeks from today is Easter Sunday, which is crazy. Uh, we got service times, 5 p.m. on Saturday, 8, 9, 30, and 11 on Sunday morning. Uh, the, if, you, if you call Peak City Home, uh, do the best you can to come to either Saturday at 5 or Sunday, rise and shine, early 8 a.m., because uh, we know 9, 30, 11 is going to be like prime time for people to come and check out our church. And so we just want to open up as many seats as possible uh, at those service times. But it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a very, very exciting time. And that's our last Sunday in this facility. Uh, our last service here before we make the big move over to 1710 Dublin Boulevard, our new facility. It's going to be awesome, which means that it's go time. All right, it's go time. It is time for us. Uh, it's time for the church to leave the building. All right, we've been talking about how the church is not a building. If the church, if we're going to be who God created the church to be, we got to be more than just what's confined to some walls. It's time to go. It's time to get out of the building and go do what we were supposed to do. It's, it's go time. And, and I mean that in a couple of ways. Obviously, it's, it's about to be go time in the sense we're about to move everything from here to a new building, and, and that's go time. I also mean that it's go time because when you think about where we are culturally, you think about where our church is right now, uh, it's time for us to get back to doing what this church has historically been best at. 
right? Which is getting out there and welcoming new people into the family. Getting out there and spreading the hope and spreading the love of Jesus to people that don't know who he is. If you didn't know, that's our mission. Our mission is not to be a church for church people, all right? Our, our, our mission is to be a church that helps people discover Jesus and follow him fiercely. That helps people who, who don't know who, he, who, who Jesus is come to understand what he's really all about. And I know we've been doing that, all right? I know, I know, I know. I know we've been doing that for, through church online. Like if you're watching with us online right now, we love you and we know God's work through church online. That's all good. But let's like real talk for a second. This pandemic has made it very, very, very difficult for us to live out our mission. It's made it difficult to love people. It's made it difficult to meet new people. It's made it difficult to invite anybody to church. I mean, come on, we got masks covering half our face. I don't know if you love me or hate me ever, right? Like, I don't know if you're a safe person or not. I can't see your face, right? We're supposed to stay six feet apart from people. You're not supposed to be with anybody that's not from your own house. <laughs> this makes it really, really hard, and we've gotten creative, and we've gotten innovative, and yes, 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 the movement of Jesus can't be stopped, but it's been really, really hard over this last year to to get out there and, and do what we do best, which is help people discover Jesus and help them understand how incredible he is and how much he's loved. And so that's why it's go time. It is time. Vaccines are coming out. I mean, when I talk to our church, half our church is vaccinated, it seems, which is great. But that just means this pandemic is coming to an end and our building is about to open, which means it is go time. It's time to get out there and help more people understand who Jesus really is than we've ever helped before. And I know when I say that, some of y'all are getting sweaty pits just thinking about it. I know some of y'all are like, I am not prepared for this. I am not ready. I need some time to prepare. All right? But by show of hands, how many of you are preparers? You, are, you like to be planned out and prepared people. If my wife didn't raise her hand, I was going to call her a liar in front of everybody. She's the most planned out person ever. Like we're getting ready to take our kids up to the mountains for a couple days on spring break and she's like planned everything out. It's amazing, right? I love being married to a planner because I'm not that way, right? Like a month ago, <laughs> a month ago I decided I was just gonna like throw my snowboard and my, my snowboard boots. I sound so Colorado right now. My snowboard my, and, my, and my snowboard boots, that didn't sound Colorado. <laughs> that, was, that was lame. I was gonna throw it in my car and just go up the mountains for the day by myself, no kids, no nothing. I'm just gonna go hit, hit the slopes, right? And so I do it, and I get, I get about an hour up in the mountains, and I realize I don't have my gloves. And, and I fall a lot because I'm still not good at it. So I need gloves. I'm like, all right, that's okay. I'll go to a store up there, and I'll find, I'll find some gloves. But I got up there like 8 a.m., and there are no stores open up there at 8 a.m., except for one little grocery store. And I went in, and they had one pair of gloves, <laughs> but it was ladies' gloves. And they were thin, like what my grandma would wear driving a Cadillac. I mean, they were like very, very feminine gloves. So there I am snowboarding all day, tough snowboarder, lady hands. You know, <laughs> it, was, it was a very different deal. So it, it's good to be prepared, right? It's good to be prepared. And I know what you're thinking, like, if we're going to be telling people about Jesus, if we're going to invite people to church, if we're going to like, if, if it's go time, like, I'm not ready, I'm not prepared for this. And what we're going to see as we wrap up the book of Colossians, our, our last message going verse by verse through Colossians, is what Paul would tell the Colossians and what he would tell us is that you are ready. You are ready. You have everything you need. You are prepared. You have what it takes. You are ready to share the love of Jesus with a world that desperately needs it. Now, if you're here and you're, you're not sure what you believe about Jesus, you're not sure what you think about God or what God thinks about you, man, it, it is great that you're here. I'm praying that you hear our heart in this today, that we are not trying to like, grow a big church for our namesake. We're not trying to get out there and like shove religion down people's throats. We're just trying to share the most important thing to us. We're, we're, we're trying to share love and hope that has transformed our lives. I mean, I look around the room right now and I can tell you story after story of people in this room whose lives have been changed for the better since they started following Jesus. And so we can't help but share this hope. I mean, how... How hateful would we have to be to have this news that God loves you unconditionally? He knows everything about you and he loves you. How hateful would we have to be to keep that to ourselves? So I, I hope you hear that, that we're just trying to figure out how we can love best by sharing Jesus. Now, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, we're going to do five verses today, five short verses. And, and I believe it's going to show you by the end of this thing that you are 
ready. All right, let's jump in. Colossians chapter 4, start in verse 2. Y'all ready? I just told you you're ready, so you better say you're ready. All right, it says this, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. All right, now I want to back it up and start at the beginning. He says, first things first. It's go time. It's time to share Jesus with people. It's time to go, 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 go. But first things first, if you're going to do it, first and foremost, you better devote yourselves to prayer. And, and he says that for a reason. You're like, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about sharing our faith with people. Well, you're, you're talking about praying. See, Paul knows if you don't love someone enough to pray for them, you don't love them enough to invite them to church. If you don't love someone enough to pray for them, you are not ready to talk about God to them. Okay? See, Paul knows if you're not praying for people, you might actually think that you can change somebody. You can't change anybody. I can't change anybody. None of us can convince someone of the realities of God. That, like, your faith is your faith. It's between you and God. The best we can do is just show you who Jesus really is, and then you and him got to got to figure it out. That's why you got to devote yourselves to prayer. You got to pray. Like first and foremost, we should be people that are praying for our neighbors, that are praying for our coworkers, that are praying for our classmates, that are on our knees just saying, God, we want you so bad to be, to be real to them. Like we, we, we want them to see who you really are. You got to devote yourselves to prayer. Every, I've said this so many times, y'all, I'm, I'm going to say it until I'm blue in the face. Every great move of God, where you see thousands of people give their lives to Jesus, there's only one thing those moves of God have in common. It's a group of people huddled up in a room praying. That's it. They all got different circumstances. They all got different situations. They all got different times and places. They all have one thing in common, and it's you and me coming together and saying, we're going to pray for people. We're going to pray for our city. We're going to pray for our community. We're going to pray, 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 because at, at the end of the day, this is, a, this is a work of God. You commit yourselves to prayer. And then I, I, I love that he says, commit yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Watchful and thankful. See, it's one thing to pray. It's another thing to pray and watch. Uh, I, have a, I have a friend in this church. His name's Frank. And Frank texts me all the time, uh, how can I pray for you? And I'll, I'll shoot him different things to pray for. And just recently, Frank sent me a text, and he said, hey, how can I pray for you? Because, oh, by the way, the thing that you asked me to pray for you last time, it happened. And I'm like, what? No, it didn't. And that, I, I backed up on my text thread with him, and I went, and, and sure enough, it's crazy because the last time that Frank asked me, what, what, I could, what, what he could be praying for for me. I said, hey, will you pray for me? Because we're, the, the last time that, uh, that he asked for a prayer was uh, mid-January. And so we were about to start our in-person gatherings again. And I hadn't preached to people in like three months. I was a little nervous, right? Like when you're, when you're alone in a room with a camera, it's a dark place. When you're in front of people, it's different, okay? So I just said, hey, man, will you pray for me as I'm getting ready to start preaching again with people? Just pray that I've got power in my preaching. Pray that I'm precise and clear in my words. And pray, and pray that I've got freedom to just be me, right? Not auditioning, not like on an extended first date. <laughs> I just want to be free to just be me how God made me to be with, with y'all. And it's so crazy because right before... Frank texted me again saying, hey, that thing came true. I had just had a conversation with Brittany. And, and, and I, told her, I was like, you know what's crazy? Since we started back our in-person gatherings, man, I just feel so free. I just feel like I can be me. And, man, I feel like God's just been giving me, like, extra power and, like, extra, like, words that, like, man, I'm not that smart. I can't come up with that many words. And it's just working. I'm like, man, God's doing something. And then Frank's like, uh, yeah. It's because it's I prayed for you. Like, I need to ask Frank for more. <laughs> Frank, Frank's really good at this, apparently. <laughs> But it's one thing to pray, it's another thing to pray and watch and see God do that. I'm telling you, if you're here and you don't know what you believe about God yet, one of the most powerful things you can do is start praying as if he's real and then watch. Because I'm telling you, praying is not wishful thinking. If you will pray for what you need, if you'll pray for what's happening in your job, what's happening in your marriage, what's happening at school, if you'll pray like God's real and then watch, you're going to see God work. You're going to see God move, and it's going to build your faith. Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. And now I love what Paul says next because he gets kind of selfish. <laughs> I love it. He says this. He says, hey, and pray for us too. <laughs> hey, while you're at it, while you're praying for yourself, hey, will you pray for me? Pray for us too that God may open a door for our message 
so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. I love how selfish he is here. He's like, hey, while you're at it, pray for me. And I love that because it gives me permission to be selfish. It gives me permission to say to you guys the same thing he said to them. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for my messages? Would you pray for me as I preach? Because sometimes, like this morning, I texted my wife saying, hey, this message is not coming together. I need your prayer. It's not easy. And I'm telling you, man, our staff team needs your prayers, needs your encouragement. My family needs your prayers, needs your encouragement. This, this stuff ain't easy. And, you know, I've, I've heard people say before that when you're in ministry and you're on staff at a church, the bullseye on your back is even bigger. I'm telling you, I, I can feel it. I can feel um, greater amounts of spiritual attack. And so I need your prayers. And I, and I ask you for that. And I know many of you do. I know many of you text me and, and tell me you're praying for me. And, and, it's, and you just need to know that's, a, that's so appreciated. It's not like, if, if, if you're ever thinking to yourself, I should, I should email, write an email to the staff, or I should, I should text them and let them know I'm, I'm praying for them and thinking about them. That's not wasted. That's, that's encouragement. That's the kind of culture we're trying to build is where we're going to encourage you all, you all encourage us, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We need it. Now, Paul doesn't spend long there. Because Paul knows that if he spends too long saying, hey, will you pray for me? Then it's going to become about Paul. And he knows that the church world, the church has a wild tendency to make leaders, preachers, pastors into celebrities, right? I mean, come on, we, if you've kept up with church news at all over the past five to ten years, you've seen horror story after horror story after horror story of church leader that gets exalted and lifted up and made to be the figurehead of everything, and then it all comes crashing down. Paul knew, he's like, I, like that can't, this can't ever be the PD show. This can't ever be the, the one leader, one pastor, one preacher. Show no, no. This is a, we're a body. We all come together. We all do our thing. We, I'll play my part. You play your part. None of our parts are more important than the other. We are a body. And so he's like, yes, pray for me. But now let's get back to what we really do, right? And here's what he says we do. He says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer everyone. I, I, I want to start with the first part. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. I love this because what Paul's trying to get us to see, and what he's trying to get the Colossian church to see, is that we need to be in, like, mission trip mode. How many of y'all by show hands have been on a mission trip? I, I have a soft spot in my heart for mission trips. Because mission trips are how I tricked my wife into dating me. Um, we went on a mission trip back in the day to Northern Ireland, and I, this is my strategy all along. I, I wasn't getting much of her attention back on, on stateside in, in the U.S., so I figured I need, to, I need to decrease the pool of candidates. I need to get her away for a solid week where there's only like seven other dudes besides me. I got a much better chance of standing out, okay? And you best believe, on the flight home from that mission trip, I was holding the hand of Brittany Bernal, who had become... Brittany Kinder, that's right. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. <laughs> you know it's right. She's over there like, you're so cute. I'm like, but it's true. Tricked you. But like, I love mission trips because like when you go on a mission trip, you have a focus. Like you, you don't ever go on a mission trip and you're just like, yeah, I guess we'll have some fun. No, you go on there like you're on a mission. You've, like for us, we were going to Northern Ireland to talk to these, these kids about Jesus, these kids that were living in poverty. And man, like we were focused, right? We were like locked in. We knew we were there for, our, our, our heads were on a swivel. We were looking for every kid we could possibly love, every person we could possibly share Jesus with. We were ready, right? I was like, you need to be in mission trip mind. You need to be wise in the way you act towards outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. See, what Paul's trying to get you and me to see is that the mission field is not across the globe. The mission field is right here. The mission field is, is right in front of us. I know, I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but Petey, come on, come on, come on. This is America. One nation under God. Come on. This is like a Christian nation. And, and we're talking about Colorado Springs. This is like this is the Bible Belt of the West. It's not the same here, right? Like you may be tricked into thinking. You may be tricked into thinking that everyone you rub shoulders with believes what you believe and is in the same place that you are spiritually. And this is where, <laughs> this is where facts are friends, okay? Facts are friends. I love facts. I love data because data just proves you wrong. 
Um, there was a, a book that came out about eight years ago called The Great Evangelical Recession. It's talking about how the church and the state of Christianity in our country is really declining. And, and, so, and they did some studies to go along with this book. And one of the studies they did is they, and they, they surveyed thousands of people across the country. This was not a, a survey done on, like, you know, just the left coast or the right coast. Like, no, it was, this was a, a wide sampling. And they gave, they gave people four basic tenets of the Christian faith, four basic beliefs, right? And when, I, I'm going to show them to you. And they're, they're very, very, like, when you read them all, you're going to be like, oh, that's basic, right? And, and, and they want to see how many people agree with this. Because, like, d- depending on the poll you look at, somewhere between 40 and 70 percent, 40 and 70, 40 and 70 percent of our country identifies themselves as a Christian, right? So you would expect somewhere between 40 and 70 percent to agree in these statements. Let me show them to you. First one is about the Bible. The Bible is God's true word. Second one is about the cross. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. The third one. Conversion, individuals need to be personally converted, like you need to make a decision that my life was going this way, but now I'm committing my life to follow Jesus. And the last one, activism, belief in the gospel needs to be expressed outwardly, right? That's, that's like, you can't just believe these things and not let them change your behaviors. You should love people more because of what you believe about God. Now, again, leave it right there. Look at those four. If you, if you grew up in church, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, or you have been at Peak City for a while, that's basic, the Bible is God's true word. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Individuals need to be personally converted, and, and the gospel should be expressed outwardly. That's just, that's basic. You'd expect the vast majority of people, certainly in Colorado Springs, to believe these things, certainly in America. What they found was that only 8% of people surveyed believe all four of those things. 8%. 8%. That's, you know, you, you're good at math. Less than one out of every 10 people Kind of hard to be less than one out of ten. Eight percent. Eight. I'm not trying to burst anyone's bubble. I'm not trying to offend anybody. This is not a Christian nation. Love our country. It is not a Christian nation. The facts are our friends. Numbers don't lie. Eight percent. Eight percent. Eight percent. Eight out of a hundred people you come across with believe those four basic tenets of the way of following Jesus. And you're like, but, but, but Petey, but Petey, Colorado Springs is different. Really? You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. When, when Brittany and I made the decision to move out here, I had people back where we had lived before, back in the Midwest, they said, why are you going to move to Colorado Springs? That's like the, that's like the evangelical mecca of the West. Like, what? they don't need another pastor, another church. Like, what are you doing going there? Like, that's just like, it's like wasting your time out there. They don't need you out there. And I'm like, okay, maybe 20, 30 years ago, and again, those of, you that lived here for, I, I, those of you that have lived here for a long time, you know this. I don't have to, you, you know what I'm about to say. 20, 30 years ago, that may have been true. But the, the tides have changed. I, I, I don't know from living in it, I know from studying it, that statistically this city has changed. Um, there was a report that came out just this last week that Colorado Springs was the fourth most desirable place to live in the country behind Denver, Boulder. I'm sorry, Boulder was number one, Denver's number two, Austin, Texas, number three, Colorado Springs. Now take those first three, Boulder, Denver, Austin. Those are cultural hubs in our country. Culture is being shaped in these countries, in, the, in, in, the, in these cities. Our, our culture is being formed here. And, and, and oh, by the way, those are not places that if you do the, the, the research on, those are not places where churches are thriving. Come over here to Colorado Springs, number fourth on the list. Our population is booming. You try to buy a house right now. Tell me how it goes. Population is booming. Church attendance is declining. It ain't the same city, guys. It's, it's different, Okay. See, but Paul's just trying to get you to see that the opportunities are everywhere. You need to look at this. Like, the mission field is not some far off distant country. The mission field is our backyard. It is where we live right now, where people need the love and the hope of Jesus more than ever. I love how Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 10. This is uh, Eugene Peterson, my boy. Uh, this is his, his paraphrasing of it. Um, he says this, Don't begin by traveling to some far off place to convert unbelievers. And don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy, president. No, 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 don't do that. Go to the lost and confused people right here in the neighborhood and tell them that the kingdom is here. 
Tell them that hope is here. Tell them that love is here. Tell them that forgiveness is here. Tell them about Jesus right here in the neighborhood. He's trying to say, make the most of every opportunity. Don't let an opportunity. I mean, you, you, this is why we put like 100 invite cards per chair on, on every chair today. Because, like, when you're, like, we want to equip you to make the most of every opportunity. Like, you, you have a barista that makes your coffee. You got a waiter or waitress that's going to wait on you today at lunch. You got neighbors. You got coworkers. You got students in your class. The opportunities are everywhere. And Paul's just trying to say, stop whiffing. <laughs> stop standing at the plate and just watching opportunities go by and not swinging. Like, get out there and, like, start trying to share Jesus with people. Start trying to spread his hope and his love. Get after it. I'm telling you, it's go time. It's time for us to get after it. It's time for us to get back to what this church has for 14 years been incredible at, which is welcoming new people into the family. Now, I know, I know, I know what you're thinking. You're like, okay, th that's great, but Petey, my pits are sweating big time right now. What do I say? Right, because like, talking about religion, talking about faith to people, ooh, my tongue's getting bigger thinking about it. Like, this is, that's like, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? And I love what Paul gives us right here. So what Paul gives us is such a beautiful, easy, um, tangible way for you to advance the kingdom, for you to tell people about Jesus. For Even if you're new, even if you're brand new, all of us can latch on to what he's about to say. He says this. Here's, here's how you make the most of it, every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace and seasoned with salt. Let your conversation be always full of grace. You know what our world is obsessed with right now? Not grace. Our world is obsessed with vengeance. We are a vengeance-based culture. You're going to get what you deserve. I mean, this is cancel culture at its core. You're going to say something wrong, you're done. We will ruin you. You did something wrong in the past, oh, but you didn't, you didn't pay for what you did, we're going to make you pay. I, I, it's vengeance obsessed. And, and be careful, I ain't talking about how evil the rest of the world is right now, because vengeance is in you and me. Vengeance is in all of us. There's a reason that when someone cuts me off in traffic, I have the need to <laughs> zoom up past them cut over in front of them, and then boom, slow it down. I will make you late for your next meeting. I will trap you. <laughs> There's a reason, right? There's a reason. Like, we got vengeance inside of us. There's a reason that when you show up and put your name on the wait list at a restaurant, and then some family that's got more people than you in that family, they had too many kids, they showed up, and they put their name on the list, and they got a table before you. There's a reason you're at the hostess stand immediately, like, excuse me. I demand a free dessert or an app, something. This is not right. Vengeance. Vengeance. We live in a vengeance culture. You know what messes with people, though? Is grace. Grace will mess people up. Grace, undeserved favor, undeserved forgiveness, undeserved kindness, unexplainable grace. That will mess with people. I love that he says, let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt. Right, like seasoned with salt. You, and you know what salt does. Any of my old guys in the room, man, I love, I love it. It's like a classic old man move to salt your food no matter what it is. Right, always put a little bit of salt on it. Because they know, they know. Old man Petey one day is going to salt every, every, every food that's on my plate. It's going to be great. You put a little salt on it, it brings out the flavor, right? It makes it unique, it makes it stand out. You, can, you, can, you, you, you appreciate it more. He's like, let your conversation be full of grace and make sure it stands out. And Paul knew. Paul knew the thing that makes our conversation stand out, the thing that makes grace stand out is Jesus. Jesus is the, the one unique thing that we have. I mean, come on. Kindness, love, all that stuff. Our culture has got actually some good examples out there that, that want nothing to do with Jesus of kindness, love, and grace. I mean, come on. You, you've seen this. Our, our culture actually loves telling those stories, and it's awesome. It's a godly thing about our culture. But what makes our grace stand out is that it comes from Jesus. I've got a, um, I'll, I'll confess this to you. I, I've not done, I've done maybe, I've done one wedding so far since I moved here. So I haven't done a lot. COVID's not been a great time for, for weddings. 
But I know where he's going to pick up, and that's just part of being a pastor. You know, you do weddings. I'll, I'll confess this to you. I have one wedding sermon, and it's the same one every time. So if you have me officiate your wedding, you're getting the same one that about 40 other couples have gotten. It's all good. I do some things to tailor it to you. I'll make it a little personal, but at the end, it's the same one. I had a friend of mine text me the other day. He's like, hey, I lost my wedding sermon. Can I have yours? I'm like, no. You can't have my wedding sermon. I'm already using it on too many people as it is. You can't have the, you can't exponentially increase my wedding sermon usage. But I've got the same thing I say to couples every single time. I say, hey, I'm praying that your marriage would grow you closer together. I'm praying that your marriage would grow you closer to Jesus. And I'm praying that your marriage would be used by God to change the world. And they always look at me like, change the world. We just trying to get married. I'm like, but you don't understand. Your marriage has the power to change the world. And I always say, because, you know, you hope, like, you're getting married right now. You hope that you have a good marriage, right? Nobody gets married thinking, 10 years, I'm going to hate this person. That's the goal. You, you think, like, we're going to have a great marriage. And, and so if you do, you, you're going to get to that point where if you've got a great marriage, you're going to have some people at some point in time that, that look you in the eye and say, how did you do it? How did you do this? How did you love each other like that? How do you have such a good marriage? And I, and I tell couples, your answer in that moment can change the world. If you answer, well... Joe's just a good guy, and I love Joe, and, you know, Joe, Joe hasn't let the pounds pack on too much over the years. He's kept it right and tight, and uh, love Joe, nice guy, and he's my soulmate. That answer doesn't do anything. If you answer, well, Susie, Susie's just great. I mean, Susie just kind of keeps me in line, and, you know, she, she helps me plan and prepare things, and she's kind of my counterpart, and she's just, she's just my soulmate. I just love Susie. The answer doesn't, doesn't, doesn't change the world. The answer that changes the world is, is the true answer. Which is the reason that I'm able to love this person sacrificially is because I have been loved sacrificially by Jesus. I, I, I try to lay my life down for them because Jesus laid his life down for me. And I, honestly, the reason our marriage works is because we just try to love each other like Jesus has loved us. And when we sacrifice for each other like Jesus sacrificed for us, that, that's it. That answer, it's full of grace and it's seasoned. It's, season, it, it's, it's got Jesus all up in it. That, that kind of an answer doesn't just raise eyebrows. That kind of an answer intrigues hearts. It gets people to go, whoa, 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 whoa. You do that because of Jesus? When, when, you, when you hear your coworkers complaining about the president, former, current, whichever, pick a, pick a president. They're always complaining. And you can say, man, whew, being president looks hard. It looks like a tough job. And you know what? Pfft, I'm not going to get all upset about that. If I, tried to, if I tried to be president, I'd be horrible at it. And man, yeah, they made some mistakes, but man, God's forgiven me of so much, I'm not going to hold that against them. I, I'm like, come on, it's grace, grace. Jesus has done so much for me. I, I, I can be full of grace towards them. That, that kind of a response changes the world. When, 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 when someone does something to you at work or at school and they wrong you and you're offended, instead of blowing up, instead of just losing it, instead of gossiping about them, instead of just slant, instead of just going nuts on them, no big deal. Man, no big deal. Jesus has forgiven me so much. I've messed up so many times in my life. How could I hold that against them? Ah, oh, man, it's all good. It's all good. Full of grace, seasoned with salt. Full of grace, focused on Jesus. Full of grace, with Jesus being the reason. That's it. That's all you need. If you went out and you responded to every conversation, if you entered every meeting, if you entered every coffee, every, every moment you shared with anyone, and your conversation was full of grace, over-the-top kindness, over-the-top love, over-the-top patience, unexplainable grace. And then you said, yeah, it's just because Jesus. Like, I, I'm not, I am that way because Jesus. Like, I'm, I'm just trying to respond like Jesus in this. That's all you need. That's how we turn the cultural tide. That's how we help people understand who Jesus really is. And, and that's why Paul says, you're ready. I mean, look, look what he says in the next verse. He says, you know, let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. He doesn't say, so you may know how to answer the grumpy people. He doesn't say, so you may know how to answer a controversy. No, no, no. So you may know how, how to answer everyone, every last person. That's all you need. He's like, but wait a minute, Petey, what if they ask me about, like, predestination and free will and stuff I don't know about? It's all good. What, what, what if they ask me about, like, evolution and, like, seven-day creation and, like, what if they ask me about, like, did Jonah really get swallowed by a whale or, like, did Noah really build the ark? Or, like, ah! Oh! You can go, I don't know! I don't know! What I do know is grace. 
I know grace. I know grace comes from Jesus. I know I've been forgiven of a lot. And I've made a lot of mistakes and God still loves me anyways. And, and, and I know that. And, 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 and that's all you need. You have the answer. You are ready. You're ready to take what Jesus died on the cross to start this movement. You're ready to take it to the streets. You're ready to take it to your workplace. You got everything you need. You're ready. So I want to pray that for you. I want to pray that for us as a church. Uh, I want to pray that on spring break Sunday, that everybody's watching online, all you bums that left Colorado Springs to go somewhere nice, and all of us that stayed here. I'm praying that on this day that our church starts to get reignited with passion and, and, and fire and intensity, not to shove religion down anybody's throat, no, to share grace, to share love, to share hope with people. Because it's go time, it's time. So would you stand up? Let me pray that for you. Jesus, we, um, we're grateful that like we sang earlier, um, you, you take what was intended for evil and you turn it for good. God, this pandemic, uh, I believe the enemy meant to crush the church with this and I believe you're gonna turn it for good. I think you're putting inside of people's hearts right now in our community a, a deeper need for relationships, a deeper need for hope and peace, a deeper need for grace. And God, I believe you've positioned us, your church, to be the ones who give them that grace. And so God, I pray right now for boldness. It's, it's the number one thing that your follower was prayed for. Um, it's the number one thing your disciples prayed for was courage to share your love with people, courage to invite people into the family. God, I pray for that boldness and courage for us right now. God, we're heading into an exciting season and we know you're gonna do big things in it. We believe you're gonna change lives, but God, it's gonna start with us extending an invitation. It's gonna start with us extending love and grace and hope. And so God, just let nothing hold us back from that. God, help us to remember that we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for someone inviting us into the fold. We wouldn't know who you really are if someone hadn't first reached out to us. And God, let us be that for the next person to walk through these doors. And so Jesus, we, uh, we lay all this at your feet. We, uh, we trust you with the weeks ahead. God, I pray over these invite cards that are gonna be taken out of here. God, I pray that they would get in the hands of people who desperately need you. God, you, you can do that. God, I, I know there's there are gonna be some people that show up to Peak City and are gonna give their testimony one day of, of the way they found this was through a, sm a simple invite from somebody in this room, from somebody watching online. And so God, we're excited about it, we believe it, and we're committed to it. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen, amen.